Kids are dismissed. Second Peter. We're looking at Second Peter chapter one, where verses three through nine is where we are. There's Bibles in the back if you don't have a Bible. Uh, I want to encourage you to uh, grab a Bible, we'll even get it now. Uh, if you don't have one, it's our gift to you. We'd love to have everyone to make sure they have a good Bible, a good translation, and a, a scripture in their home that they can read. I remember growing up, Mama, you had to, that, that giant Bible in your room all the time, right? Remember those Bibles with the pictures? Those big bloated babies floating in the Yeah, yeah, I had one of those too. But Mom always had a Bible and prayed for me, and, and uh, I appreciate that. And pray for your kids, pray for your kids. So we're in 2 Peter chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. And we know this from last week, if you were not here, that 2 Peter is now the second letter that the apostle is writing. Peter is writing these, uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, to the scattered churches throughout Asia Minor, which is today would be considered Turkey. Uh, the first letter of Peter that we looked at, I think we began studying Peter together in January of this year, walking verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We like to do that here. We do expository preaching. We figure that's the way the Spirit wrote it. That's the way we, you know, learn it and grow and, and study it together. So we started First Peter back in, chapter, uh, back in January and walked our way through that. And we, we said back then that First Peter was written to the same area, Asia Minor, and that First Peter was written in the early 60s A.D., to a church that was, or many churches that were under persecution. Nero was the emperor of Rome, and he didn't like Christians, and he was persecuting Christians. And in 1 Peter, uh, Peter wrote this letter to encourage these, these folks, these churches, these multiple churches, to remain strong in the Lord. He encouraged them to, to be faithful. And he tells them that their salvation is secure in Christ, that they are to submit to the governing authorities, and in all things they are to give glory and honor to Christ, and that they should stand firm knowing that Jesus is coming back. Suffering is not the end. Glory is that we will not suffer forever, but if you're a Christian, there's a day in which Jesus will return and we will be with him forever. And it's an encouraging letter. 1 Peter. 2 Peter, a little bit differently, written about six or seven years after the first letter. Nero had lit a fire in Rome, burned part of the city down, blamed Christians, and then what used to be just a persecution became a very severe persecution among Christians. And Peter is writing this letter from Rome to these churches while this fierce persecution is going on. In fact, Historians tell us that both Peter and the Apostle Paul were both martyred under Nero. So Peter's writing 2 Peter after the fire, during the severe persecution, and right before his martyrdom. You can see in the letter he writes about, my end is coming near, I'm drawing close to dying, and, he, and I, want to, I want to write this letter to tell you about false teachers. That's kind of the main thrust of 2 Peter. 1 Peter, encouragement pastoral, 2 Peter, polemic, more argumentative, and, 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 and writing against false teachers of that day. And he wants to articulate, which he does, that we are there to stand firm, stand firm in the gospel. That the false teachers were rising up, even in the midst of persecution, these false teachers were rising up, they were perverting the gospel. And that troubled Peter. They were distorting scripture. That troubled Peter. They were... Uh, downplaying the judgment of God and the coming day of Christ. And that troubled Peter. And Peter articulates in this letter that we are to overcome these false teachers and their errors by standing firm on the knowledge of God. The word knowledge is used at least nine times in 2 Peter. So all this was troubling to Peter. We mentioned last week on how important it is, this letter to our culture. And I, I forgot to show you this. I wanted to show you. Uh, what's going on in our culture today in Albany, about the knowledge of God, about the true knowledge of God. I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is, Barna has done a recent study, and the most post-Christian cities in America, number one, Albany. Albany is the number one city in America, post-Christian cities. That's amazing. Also amazing, it did the same study recently, is America's most Bible-minded cities. Number one, you got a Tennessee, one in L.A. Um, these are all number one. The most Bible-minded cities 
on this side, you can't really see that. I could hardly read. So, oh, Chattanooga, there's uh, Springfield, there's all that. We're over here, two from the bottom. I think 90, let me see, 96 Providence, 90, 96 Providence, 95 Albany. So if you want to know the knowledge of God, don't come to Albany. <laughs> Stay away. It's amazing because some of them are even aren't, aren't even in the Bible Belt, as we would say in the Southern. But, so Albany is the post, most post-Christian city in America, and two from the bottom when it comes to knowledge of God. Bible-minded cities. Know my Bible. You know the sword drill? Some of you have been through that. You, 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 you say a scripture verse, and you got to, you know, some of you guys, I'm sure some of you older folks that have been Christians for a while, I don't mean older in that way. I've got to be careful. But, um, you know, you say, you know, 2 Peter 3, and as soon as you open up, you get it, you stand up. Don't do that in New York. Don't do that in Albany, because they'll be like, Bible, who, what, where? You know, they don't know. So the knowledge of God, so as we, we're going to talk about this in Gospel 301, if you have the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God, of the true one and living God, you're in a minefield of, of, uh, of all kinds of things in our culture. But what a great opportunity to live for Jesus in that kind of culture. So don't let it frighten you. Let it excite you. That God has placed you here. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you love him and you come to the knowledge of salvation of Christ, you're here in the least Bible city so that you can declare his excellence and his glory to the, your neighbor, to your family. And Peter, this letter is so important and up to date for us. He uses the word knowledge because it's important to know the living God. In fact, the word knowledge is not just intellectual, cognitive. Peter uses that word gnosis, but it's more than that. Epinosis is the full knowledge of God. He talks about not just knowing him up here, but he's talking about knowing him in here. A living participation in the truth, a walking in it, experientially, relationally, intimacy with God, with the creator of the universe through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the difference between being a possessor of truth and having the truth possess you. It's one thing to know here. It's another thing to be possessed by the truth. One will change you. We'll look at that in a little while. From the outside, the other one will change us from the inside out. Truth that possesses you changes you from the inside out. Last week, we said, if you open your Bible, 2 Peter, look at verse 1, uh, that Peter makes it clear, and, and I need you to see this this morning. Peter makes it clear that not only is he Simon Peter, the old name and the new name, the, the natural birth, the rebirth, he's a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. Right? So there's not one faith for the apostle and one faith for us. He says equal faith, equal standing, Paul, Peter, all the apostles came the same way, by grace. But he makes it clear that our righteousness, look what he says, and our justification is not our own, it's because of Jesus' righteousness. To those who obtain the faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness, how? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our ability, Peter's ability, our ability to stand before God now and in eternity Accepted, forgiven, rescued, redeemed people depend entirely upon the righteousness, not of Peter, but of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. The word righteousness has to do with, with um, uh, conformity to a standard, that which is righteous and perfect, which none of us are. But Jesus is, and only Jesus lived a perfect life, and therefore only Jesus can die an atoning death for your sins. We were talking about that this week in community group. That Jesus, when you say that Jesus was perfect, he lived a sinless life, it's not just information. Because God's standard doesn't change. You hear me? God's standard doesn't change. Because Jesus lived a perfect, righteous life, fulfilled the law completely, when he dies, an atonement for our sins rises from the grave. Those who have faith in him, the Bible says, his righteousness is imputed to us. It's called justification. It's the, it's, the, it's the doctrine of how does one become right with God when we're sinners and he's not. His righteous standard is perfection. Ours is not. We, we, we sin. We fall. We're, we're not perfect as he is perfect. So Jesus comes and lives a perfect life, 
Therefore, he can die an atoning death. So when people, or excuse me, when, when the Father sees us, he sees us in the righteousness of Christ, having fulfilled the law. Not that you and I have, but because Jesus does, we are accepted in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, that's my sin, your sin, so that in him, I, me, we, might become the righteousness of God. You see that? You need to see that. Because that's how we become accepted by the Father. God doesn't just forgive us of our sins. As if he looked down and said, you know what, these people are wicked, uh, they're sinners, and what they really need is forgiveness, so I'm just going to forgive them, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the perfect standard of righteousness so they can come into my holy presence. That's not what happens. If God did that, he would no longer be God. God held his standard of holiness. Jesus meets that holiness, dies an atoning death, rises from the grave, and now we, by faith, are justified. We're made right. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed, accounted to us. God no longer sees us in our sins, sees the righteousness of Christ, and we are now justified. That's what Peter says. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1, if you don't have it online in your Bible, it's a great Bible verse memory. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter's arguing the same thing Paul said in chapter 5 of Romans. That when you know this truth, you really know it, you possess it. Look at verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. This reality of the righteousness and justification of Christ is now given to me by a gift, and now grace and peace will be multiplied to you. Okay, you remember that? Let me see if I have the next verse up. Do I have that? Romans 5, 1, okay. Last week, we ended in verse 3, talking about the call. You remember that? We're talking about the call of God. Look what he says in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and and godliness. So God's power comes into our lives, look what it says, through, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. When Peter talks about the call he did in 1 Peter, he talks about the call of conversion. He says God called us out of darkness into light. He talks about the call where God awakens our soul, awakens our mind, sees our sins, sees the glory of Christ, and we repent of our sins and believe on him. That's the call. It's a call of conversion. It, what they call the effectual call has been known as that. 2 Timothy 2.9, Paul writes to Timothy, Join me in the suffering for the gospel, according to the power of God. See the theme, suffering and according to the power of God. 2 Timothy 2.9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, effectual calling, a, a set-apart calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. From all eternity, God planned this and then calls us, awakens us, and we see the glory of Christ. Look at this. I, and you need to see this. And I want to spend a little time on this because before we move forward, you have to see what Paul is, excuse me, Peter is laying out for us. Verse 3, he says that power has been given to us by the call to his glory and excellence. You know what that means? That means the call of God in our lives gave us the ability to see the glory and goodness or excellence of Christ. That when you and I came to faith in Jesus, you and I had seen his moral beauty, his, his glorious character, and on the cross of Christ where we see his glory, and we perceived that, repented of our sins, and believed on him. Paul says it beautifully in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He said, let light shine out of darkness, and God has shown it in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That means, that means that the events of the cross, that means the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary for our salvation was designed by God to reveal the infinite beauty and incalculable glory and worth of Christ on the cross. On the cross. So you need to see what Peter is saying before we can move on. For he does not only 
show us the gospel, which he says in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, but he moves on to talk about the transforming work of the gospel in our lives. Okay? And that's the text before us. Here's the gospel, the righteousness of Christ, the calling of God, his divine power is given to us, all the work of God, not our power, it's his power. And then Peter will move on to chapter uh, 1, verse 5, talking about the transforming work of the gospel, okay? So as we walk through this, and, and um, hopefully we'll see this, particularly we'll spend time in, in 1 and 3 of, these, of this outline, but first we'll see the provision that Peter has made for us, excuse me, God has made for us, that Peter points out. Then we will see the progress that for every Christian, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys some questions today. I, I want you to put that curtain around your heart, and, and before the Lord, ask yourself some questions. Okay? And then finally, we'll see the pardon that needs to be remembered. And that, that's our outline. So look with me in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Three quick things. Number one, God's power. Number two, God's promise. Number three, God's presence is all in that verse. God's power, God's promises, and God's presence. Okay? He says, look what he says to the believer. Listen, my power has been given to you, my power has been given to you, notice the contrast, so that you can be partakers of the divine nature and escape from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. When we have the divine nature and the promises and the presence of God, we're escaping that which is corruption, which is corruptible. God's not corruptible. You see the, see the contrast there. And what Peter is con combating against is the false teaching that was going on in that day. That the false teaching would tell you that you can't really know whether you're a Christian. You can't really know whether God forgives you. You can't really know whether you're saved because salvation is of, of this special knowledge. As you get more and more aware of it and you grow in your salvation and someday you could be saved. Folks, let me tell you, the Bible uses the word being saved or salvation in three different tenses in Scripture. It's easy to point out one and leave out the past, uh, other ones. The Bible talks about our salvation being in the past. Ricky read Colossians, having been forgiven of our sins. The Bible talks about salvation of the past, that we have been freed from the penalty of sin for those who've trusted in Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness, that's the justification. We've been freed from the penalty of sin, okay? His divine power has granted to us. The Bible talks about it from the past. It also talks about the present, that we have been set free from the power of sin. Not only the penalty of, of our sins, but we've been freed from the power of sin. We'll see that today, that we can, be, um, we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ, that we've been set free from the power of sin. But the Bible also talks about us being forgiven by the presence of sin. The presence of sin. That when life is over, Christ returns, new heaven, new redeemed earth, we will be without sin. I know that's hard to even imagine. Maybe some of you think you're there already. I don't know. You're not. Sorry. But someday we will. Romans 8 says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemptions of our body. The whole earth is groaning for that day that we'll be free from the presence of sin. And the earth will be free from the presence of sin. Peter says, listen, the power for today, the, the present time of being released from, the, from, the, from the, uh, the power of sin in our lives today, is because God's power, see that? God's power dwells within you. His divine power has granted to us, right? We can't generate it. It is God who clothes us in his righteousness, we saw, pardons us for our sins, and then empowers us by his spirit. Romans 8, 
if the spirit of him, now, now listen to this carefully, if, Paul writes, if the spirit of him, that's God, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies, bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. You hear what he just said? The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who, who raised Jesus from the dead three days, okay, in the grave, risen to life, if that same spirit that empowered that magnificent, glorious resurrection from the grave dwells within Christians by way of the Holy Spirit. And that power has been given to us because of the righteousness of God. And, and, and look, what he, it, it, it's for, look what he says, verse 3. That power has been granted to us so that we can live how? Life and godliness. The word godliness literally means well worship. And what's so cool about that word is godliness means devotion. Godliness means worship of God. Godliness, first and foremost, does not mean morality. Okay? You need to know that. So ungodliness does not mean only crazy people that live in Cleveland. You think that's ungodly, and it is. But godliness, first and foremost, has to do with your devotion, your worship of God. Why that's so important is because peop, there are people who live very moral lives and they're ungodly. Because they're living for their own glory, their own honor, their own accolades. They're not giving glory and honor to God. The Spirit does not dwell within them and they are living ungodly, but they pay taxes. They care for their families. They do all the morally right things. What Peter's saying is life, zoe, uh, uh, that's the word in the Greek, and godliness is that you and I have been empowered to live for the glory of God. To live for the glory of God. So if we sin and we rebel and we do things that we shouldn't do and we know we shouldn't do that, we can't say that God didn't give us the strength to do it. We can't say that. It says right here that he has given us the power. He's given us the power and the power dwells within us. It is the same power that rose Christ from the grave. He says, if you belong to Christ, you've been empowered by Christ. And if you've been empowered by Christ, look what he says. You've been given his precious promises. His precious is, is his, his worth, so, you know, a, a, something we can't imagine, worth, a, 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 valuable promises that he's given to us. So what he's saying is, you've been empowered, and through the empowerment, you've been given promises. And look what he says, through the promises, you've become partakers of the divine nature. The promises of God have been given to you in Christ. Now, I think the promises that Peter's talking about, and some of you have some wonderful promise of God that you love, and you, you say amen. All the promise of Christ, the Bible says, is in, in Christ is yes and amen. And you have promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have promises that, that are just mean a lot to you, and you should hold on to those promises. We should search the scriptures for the promises of God. And stand upon those promises. But I think Peter is generally talking about the promises of the gospel. All the things that God has promised to us in the gospel. Notice what he says, verse 4, the beginning of verse 4. By which he has granted us these precious and very promises. That by which is connected to glory and excellency in the gospel. So he's saying by the gospel, by the salvation, when we come to, to, to see and savor the glory of Christ... We have been empowered and we have received the precious promises and the divine nature we've become partakers of. I, I can't overstate this. I, I, just, I just want to let that sink in. If you're a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, his power has been given to you. His promises are yours by, by the free gift of God through the righteousness of Christ, and his divine nature, the presence of God, God dwelling within you, his very life in you, dwells within you by the way of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you become little gods. It doesn't say you have a divine nature. And some people teach that. You're a little god. You're not. 
there's something very inherently different between the creator God and finite man. But he says you become partakers of this divine nature. There's some people that say because you have the divine nature, you're able not to sin anymore. That's not true either. All of us know all too well, 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. If we say we have not sinned, the truth is not in us. But Peter wants us to know that not only the promises of God have been given to us and the power of God has been given to us, but the very presence of God is dwelling within us and leads us to life and godliness. That, that's what he's saying. And, and, I, and I really need you to see that, that Peter is talking about be, um, th this work of God in our lives because when he gets to the second part, which is not only the provision received, but the progress required, once we have that fully in our mind of all that Christ has done, his power, his promise, his presence, the righteousness of Christ has been given to me. It's not my righteousness. It's not my moral standard. It's Christ. He died for me. Now in the courtroom of God, I'm justified. I'm made right with God. We have responsibilities. I can't say it any other way. Well, there's a requirement for us. Look what he says. Verse 5. For this reason, what we just said, make every effort to supplement your faith. Add to your faith. He, uh, Peter, uh, excuse me, Paul says to the Philippian church, as you always obeyed, now in my presence more, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see the human responsibility in this. We're to add to our faith. We are to supplement our faith. Now, some of you take vitamins, right? Protein shakes, supplements, especially as you're getting older, the bones start to weaken on you. You're taking uh, glucosamine. You're like, I, I need some supplements. I need my, my, my 50 and older, you know, vitamin. So I'll be taken soon. Okay, you need supplements, because things aren't working the way they used to work. And you want to remain strong. Peter says, supplement your faith. Paul says, work out your salvation. Paul writes to Timothy, you have nothing to do with myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The word train is gymnazo, exercise. Okay? So, there's work to do. It's called spiritual disciplines. Wonderful books. If you're, if you're interested in reading a book on spiritual disciplines, I have a couple of them. They're just awesome. It's about daily Bible reading. It's about corporate gathering. It's about connecting in community group. It's about living life together. It's about growing in your walk, adding to your faith the things that will help you to grow spiritually. That's what he's talking about. And, 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 and let's, let's, you know, let's see what he says. He says, first, put on virtue. Virtue means goodness, honesty. You're a trustworthy person. You're growing to, and being more honest and more trustworthy. You're, you know, people can count on you. Goodness, moral excellence. He said, with that, put in knowledge. Add knowledge to your faith. Knowledge is not the knowledge of that, of that salvation experience he's talking about here. He's talking about just information. What are you reading these days? You're spending more time on Facebook posts than you are in reading scripture, reading some good godly literature, are you so deep in some novel that you're reading all the time but don't spend any time? Maybe We have a library in the back, by the way. We have like 500 books. There's some awesome books back there. Are you spending time in your goodness? Are you spending time in your knowledge? Are, are you growing in the word? Are you growing with other authors that, that you, you, you may like and, and growing in your faith, learning, getting wisdom? And I'm going to say this, uh, and you've heard me say it a million times. You can't grow as a Christian, and I stand on the word of God, unless you're in community. Because the peace that you bring to community is something that I need. As you learn and grow in your faith, and you're engaging Christ, and you're learning and, and growing in knowledge, when you share that with me, I grow with you. If you're isolated, you're not going to learn from me, and I'm not going to learn from you. He says, so add virtue, add knowledge, add self-control. As Christians, we need to not be tossed to and fro with bad habits, with, with um, addictions and, and, and vices. He says, you're not a prisoner. Grow in your self-control. Inner strength, that's what he's talking about. Controlling one's desires and cravings. Grow in your steadfastness. 
right? Uh, steadfastness, you know the word, it, it's continuing on. Pressing forward. It's when trials and difficulties come. You, you don't run. You don't shrink. You walk. I think of, of Mrs. Miller, uh, Marion Miller, uh, uh, Paul's mom. Uh, when I see Steadfast, I think of her. She just lost her husband last week, and she just took care of him for like 15 years, day in and day out, faithful, steadfast, caring. He says, grow in godliness, the character of God. Are we reflecting the gospel? The Bible says in Romans 8 that God who foreknew us predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Godliness, you're growing in godliness. Brotherly affection. Add to your faith brotherly affection. It's easy to sometimes to love people outside the church than it is people inside the church. Peter's like, no, that, that, we can't have that. Love the one sitting next to you. Love the one sitting in front of you. Love the ones on the softball field. Love the ones in your community group. Love the ones that are on the band. Love the ones that are in the different teams that we have going on brotherly affection philadelphia brotherly love have affection toward one another then he says grow in your love which is agape love he used a different greek word and notice that he ends this whole section of of these these things we are to add on to our faith with love which is the supreme supreme virtue paul says in first corinthians right eh, if you don't have love clanging sound banging cymbals Love one another. So sacrifice and, and, and care for and, and love one another and demonstrate it. I was reading this week that uh, someone pointed out that Peter, when he starts in verse 5, he mentions the stuff that is internal, faith and virtue, and ends with stuff that is external. It's loving one another. And he puts this chain together and ends with love. He says, look at, look at what he says in the next verse, verse uh, 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they'll keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's the opposite of that? If they're not growing, you're not being effective. You're not being fruitful. But if you are growing in these areas, in these qualities, you'll be effective. You'll be fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, where are you at in your spiritual growth? Where are you at with adding to your faith these virtues that Peter describes? Take them home this week. Look over them. If we're not growing, we're shrinking. Faith is like a muscle. When you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. And he says, exercise your faith, add this to you. Now, if I ended our sermon here and I said, now I want the church to go and practice these things, um, I think I can be um, uh, guilty of malpractice. Okay? Because where's the power? He gives us it in the next verse. I love this. Look at this. Look at verse 9. Underline this. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he's been cleansed from his former sins. Peter's concern is not only with false teachers, but Peter is concerned that we are growing in the wrong way. Notice he didn't say, for whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted and has not done enough Bible study. Or that he is nearsighted and he has not had enough devotional time. All those things are good. He says, no, if you don't have these qualities, the bottom line is because you have forgotten that you were cleansed from your sins. You're like, Peter, really? Can't you give us some more instruction on how I can grow? That's how my heart works. Just tell me what to do. 20 minutes in the morning, I got it. I can do that. Read one psalm a day. Okay. You know, I can, like, I can lay that out for you. And Peter says, no, if you're not growing in these virtues, it's because they have forgotten that you were cleansed from your sins. Why would he do that? It's because... When you and I come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by grace alone, we have a tendency to start adding, we start adding things that are outside of grace in order to help us to grow. So in other words, we come to faith by grace and then we grow by the law. And that's not what the Bible teaches. What Peter is talking about, and there's two ways to grow spiritually. Hear me, family. There's the mechanical way and there's the organic way. 
The mechanical way of spiritual growth is by adding something from the outside. If you own a car um, junkyard, the way to grow your junkyard is to add more cars mechanically. Organically, plant a tree and watch from inside it grow with branches and leaves. It comes from the inside and not from the outside in. That's the difference between growing externally through moralism, through legalism, by adding externally through growing in the gospel. In understanding, a deeper understanding of the gospel that helps you grow organically from the inside out. And what happens is, and I don't know if it's happened to you, it's happened to me, we come to faith by grace, our sins are forgiven, we can't bring nothing to Jesus, he comes and he, all we give him is our sin, he gives us our, his righteousness, and then we start adding things on to our lives. Peter went to great lengths in his letter to tell us that salvation is the work of God. That the righteousness of Christ has been given to us as his glory and beauty has been revealed. That we are empowered by him through his precious promises. We have the spirit of God dwelling within us. But he says, if you haven't grown, you're nearsighted. Remember the gospel. That's what he's saying, remember the gospel. I say it all the time, I say it one more time. The gospel and religion are two different things. Religion is I will obey and therefore God owes me and loves me and will accept me. I'll just keep working. I'll just keep doing. And someday I think God is liking me now. I think God is accepting me now. I think God really likes me and I'm I'm sensing his love now because I'm working. That's religion. The gospel is Jesus dies an atoning death. His righteousness has been given to me by faith alone. And therefore, I am loved. I am accepted. I belong to him. And therefore, I will obey him. There's a difference between the two. There's obedience. Sometimes it's hard to even see. You see someone working hard for the Lord. They're obeying. They're going to the Bible. So they're doing all the things. You really don't know the motive of their heart. God does. And they're doing all the right things. But what they're doing is trying to be accepted by God, trying to be loved by God, trying to get an identity without the gospel. And those who have a sense of the gospel and have a, 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 a heart change of the gospel needs to be reminded of the gospel. That's what Peter's saying. If you're not growing in these virtues, remember the gospel. Your sins have been forgiven. It was Martin Luther, and I think Peter would say the same thing. Is the principle is that religion... I'm working to get God to love me, is the deep default mode of the human heart. This is what Martin Luther writes. writes, The heart continues to work in that way, work towards our salvation, even after the conversion to Christ. Though we recognize and embrace the principle of the gospel, our hearts will always be trying to return to the mode of self-salvation, which leads to spiritual deadness, pride, strife, and ministry ineffectiveness. See? You want to be fruitful? You want to be effective? He says, if you want to be working for your salvation, you will not be. And the problem is we grow spiritually, externally, when our spiritual growth becomes getting, trying to get God to love us. We become a performance-based salvation. And as a Christian, I'm speaking to Christians, you have to check your heart. If you get saved by grace alone, and all of a sudden you're adding to your faith externally what I can do in order to be loved and to be accepted, what happens when you actually do your list? You become prideful. Look at me. We've all been there. Why didn't that person do this? I do that. Why can't they do that? Look at the mess they're in. Look at, you know, all of a sudden, well, we have a list. We kept it. Why haven't they? We become prideful. What happens when you have a list and you fail? Have you ever failed before? Have you ever had a list of do's and don'ts and failed and feel the shame, the guilt, and the despair? Because it's a performance-based salvation. It's a performance-based salvation. Moralism becomes our self-approval and our self-salvation project. When we move from a grace-based relationship with God to a performance-based relationship with God, we become bewildered we either become prideful or we become ineffective and we become uh uh, you know beating ourselves up and and walking away in shame when our primary goal is to conquer sin by our rules instead of seeing and savoring the finished work of christ on the cross we begin to shrink and we become self-absorbed 
what are, we, what, what, what are we looking at? What are we trying to do? Get our life in order or seeing and savoring and loving and treasuring and getting the gospel, free gift of God, died for my sins, rose from, from, my, from my justification deeper into our hearts. Listen to this quote. And I'm almost finished. Just, just give me one more second. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson said this. this. is a great quote. Those who have almost forgotten about their own spirituality because their focus is so exclusively on their union with Jesus Christ and what he accomplished are those who are growing and exhibiting fruitfulness. One's a self-absorbed, you know, self-salvation, and the other one is so absorbed with the beauty and the glory of Christ. You want to get away from sin? Run to Jesus. See Jesus, see him in his glory, in his moral beauty, in his excellence. Savor him, treasure him, make much of him, and watch how sin will be done away with. Now, I, I want to make it really clear. The Bible talks about obedience. The Bible talks about prayer. The Bible talks about community. There is something we are to do, okay? There is the work of, justifi- of sanctification, the work that God is working in us. That is absolutely right. It's the motive that I'm talking about. Jerry Bridges in his book, uh, actually the transforming power of the gospel, I saw that from him. Don't tell him. Um, He calls this tension between human responsibility and God's empowerment divine responsibility. No, excuse me, dependent responsibility. We're dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and yet we're responsible to add those things to our faith. The question is, how? And he writes this, a daily appropriation, this is how you do it. This is how you grow organically. This is how you grow through the spirit and and not by legalism or moralism or, or by turning your back on the law and saying, I don't have to obey. This is what he says, a daily appropriation of the gospel. He loves me. He died for me. He's clothed me with righteousness. I am a sinner saved by grace. A daily appropriation of the gospel on which we see that our sins are forgiven and that we stand before God clothed in the spotless righteousness of Christ is the key to the diligent pursuit of holiness. That's exactly what Peter is saying in this. Gospel, 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 sanctification, gospel. Don't forget the gospel. Sanctification involves work, a dependency on the power of God. But we will never be without sin, and therefore when we sin, rather than feel, or rather than sense a disintegration, a a, a shame, we should not feel despair, we should run to the cross. The answer is the gospel. It is the assurance of the gospel that indeed our guilt has been taken care of, our sins have been forgiven, there is no condemnation for us in Christ, and that should motivate motivate us and must motivate us to love, treasure, and obey Jesus. And when we do... And we blow it, we do, we move on. When we do the right thing, we give him glory and praise. We must always keep focus of the gospel. It is the gospel that brings sanctification to the heart. Instead of driving us uh, away from Christ, it should drive us to Christ. It should drive us to deepen our love for him and to obey him more because of the gospel. It is the gospel that's believed every day that's the only enduring motivation to pursue our sanctification. Okay, now, just a couple of things to walk away with so you can think about this. If you are sinning, whether it be lack of self-control, what are you relying upon other than the gospel? What do you think you need for you to have a self, an identity that you're trusting in, that you're willing to steal, you're willing to to sin, you're willing to, to run after? You're not applying the gospel to your life. If you don't have steadfastness and, and you're easily giving up, you don't see the gospel that God doesn't give up on you and wooed you and loved you and has placed his eternal hand upon you, stand firm in the gospel. If you are troubled with goodness and you're just, you're just a rotten person, nobody raise your hand. You fail to see the gospel. That it was the goodness of God that turned and changed your heart when you were running away from him and you were an enemy of him. You see how the gospel applies. Tullian Chavidian, he's the grandson of Billy Graham. In his book, great book, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He writes this, grace alone melts the heart and changes us from the inside out. <laughs> 
Progress and obedience happens only when our hearts realize that God's love for us does not depend on our progress of obedience. Should we obey? Absolutely. But we should look at our obedience through the lenses of the gospel. We should look at our disobedience through the lenses of the gospel. We should look at adding our, to our faith all those virtues by in, driving home the gospel in our lives. When we don't have those things in our lives, the reason is not more Bible studies, although that's good. It's not more prayer, although that's good. It is because we have forgotten that our justification and our righteousness and our clothed in the righteousness of Christ is ours as a free gift. You have nothing to earn. There's no self-salvation. And you know what happens, family? The deeper you drive that home, the more radical you live. It doesn't matter if I blow it, because if I blow it, I'm covered. I'm going to live generously for Jesus. I'm going to share the gospel generously to others. I'm going to live radically in my face, trusting him when all life around me is falling apart, because in the gospel, I am completely secure in him. Nothing this life can throw at me. I'm secure in him because of the gospel. That's what Peter is saying because of the gospel. Last quote, and we'll pray. The band comes up. Listen to this quote. Tillian, again in his book, whatever you discover is that once the gospel frees you from having to do anything for Jesus, you want to do everything for Jesus. Got that? Whatever you'll, whatever you'll discover is that once the gospel frees you from having to do anything for Jesus, you'll want to do everything for Jesus, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. Family, the only way to deal with the ever-present struggle of sin in my life, in your life, in the long haul of life, is to make your progress in the gospel, to cultivate a disdain for sin in light of his glorious acceptance, security, forgiveness, redemption that is in Christ that will free you to obey and to grow in your Christian walk. Father, just thank you so much for the work of Jesus. Father, if, for me anyway, and I know for some here, it's a little overwhelming. But God, we just pray that as we look at our lives, as we, as we see our lives, as we, we add and supplement our lives, as we grow in faith, Lord, it will be done in the gospel. And Lord, I pray for those who know you that are here that may have been working to earn your love, working to earn your favor, working to earn your acceptance, Lord. They would rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and then in his love, motivated by love and joy and, and, and uh, the presence and power of the, in their lives because you dwell within them, they will live radically for Jesus. They will love their spouses. They will love their neighbors. They will love those people around them and point them to Jesus. Father, there are some here that may see all this and say, you know what, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not really sure. Father, we pray that your spirit would show them the work is done. Christ accomplished everything for them. That they should turn from their sins and turn to Jesus. Embrace him, love him, treasure him. It's done. In Christ, there's forgiveness of sins. In Christ, there's empowerment to live above the, the, the every mundane life but without purpose because Christ has come, paid the price, clothed them in his righteousness, and makes them right before you. Father, as we respond in music, we pray your spirit would drive our hearts closer to Jesus, deeper in the gospel. May we give up our self-righteousness. May we give up our pride. May we give up our uh, superiority and inferiority and be confident because of the cross of Jesus. We pray all this in his name.